Let's get weird into it. Number nine, the head back nosebleed. Picture this. You're a kid, it's recess, and a rogue dodgeball has decided your face is its new home. Suddenly, your nose is leaking like a faulty faucet. An adult rushes over, pinches the bridge of your nose, and yells, Lean your head back. You comply, feeling the warm, metallic taste of your own life force trickling down your throat. You were taught this was the correct, dignified way to handle a facial hemorrhage. Unfortunately, this advice is not only wrong, it's a recipe for a truly disgusting disaster. When you tilt your head back, the blood doesn't magically disappear. It's not reabsorbed into the ether. It's just rerouted. Instead of dripping onto your shirt, it's now taking a scenic tour down your esophagus and into your stomach. Your stomach, which is designed to handle chewed up pizza and questionable life choices, is not a fan of straight blood. It's a powerful irritant, which means you're setting yourself up for a spectacular round of nausea and, potentially, blood vomit. Congratulations, you've just invented a new way to clear a room. The correct way to handle a nosebleed is to do the exact opposite. Lean forward. Pinch the soft, squishy part of your nose, not the hard, bony bridge where your glasses sit, and hold it for a solid 10 to 15 minutes. This allows the blood to clot properly and exit the way it came in, which is far more civilized. Tilting your head back is basically turning your throat into a gore-filled slip and slide for no reason. So, next time your face starts leaking, remember, lean forward unless your goal is to dramatically cough up blood and scare a small child. Your call. Number 8. Buttering a burn. There exists a strange, primal urge in the human brain. When faced with a minor burn from a hot pan or a splash of boiling water, our first instinct is to raid the refrigerator. Not for ice, not for a cold cloth, but for the butter dish. The logic seems to be, ah yes, this searing injury needs a dairy-based sealant. For generations, people have been slathering butter, margarine, or even mayonnaise on their burns, believing it to be a soothing, homespun remedy. This is like trying to put out a fire with a fluffy blanket. A burn is essentially trapped heat energy cooking your skin cells. The absolute first thing you need to do is dissipate that heat. And what is butter? It's fat. It's an insulator. When you smear butter on a burn, you're not cooling it down. You're trapping the heat in. You are effectively creating a tiny, greasy greenhouse on top of your smoldering flesh, ensuring the damage goes deeper than it otherwise would have. On top of that, you're introducing a non-sterile organic substance full of potential bacteria directly into compromised skin, which is a fantastic way to invite a nasty infection to the party. The only thing you should be putting on a fresh burn is cool, not freezing, running water, for at least 10 to 20 minutes. This pulls the heat out of the skin and stops the cooking process. Then, you cover it with a sterile dressing. That's it. Basically, by buttering a burn, you're slow cooking your own skin. Save the butter for your toast, which, unlike you, is supposed to be hot and crispy. Number seven, peroxide power. Has there ever been a more visually satisfying medical treatment than pouring hydrogen peroxide on a scraped knee? You watch it bubble and fizz, and you just know it's working. It's like a tiny, angry volcano erupting on your skin, heroically murdering every germ in its path. We've all been told that the fizzing is the sound of victory, the death rattle of bacteria. It feels clean. It feels proactive. Well, that satisfying fizz is actually a sign of indiscriminate chemical warfare. Hydrogen peroxide is an oxidizing agent which means it destroys cells by ripping them apart on a molecular level. And here's the problem. It's not picky. It doesn't just hunt down evil bacteria. It massacres everything. It touches, including the healthy skin cells and the brand new fragile tissue your body is desperately trying to build to heal the wound. It's the microscopic equivalent of nuking a city to get rid of one bad guy. Those little bubbles are just oxygen being released as the peroxide breaks down. While it does kill some bacteria, it also kills your fibroblasts, the construction worker cells responsible for weaving new skin together. By using it, you're essentially blowing up the construction site every single day and wondering why the building isn't finished yet. Modern wound care specialists will tell you the best way to clean a minor cut or scrape is with simple soap and water, followed by a thin layer of antibiotic ointment and a bandage. It's boring. It's not theatrical. But it allows your body to heal without having its efforts chemically firebombed. Number six, the Ipecac Purge. If you grew up in the 80s or 90s, your family medicine cabinet probably contained a little brown bottle of something called Ipecac syrup. This was the emergency go-to. The thinking was simple and brutal. If a kid swallows something they shouldn't have, like a mysterious berry from the garden or a capful of cleaner, you make them vomit immediately. You force the poison out the way it came in. 
Ipecac was incredibly effective at this, triggering a violent projectile purge that could empty a stomach in minutes. The problem is, the get it out philosophy is a dangerously blunt instrument. Firstly, the damage from many corrosive substances, like bleach or drain cleaner, is done on the way down. Forcing it back up means you're burning the esophagus, larynx, and mouth for a second time. It's like getting punched in the face and then asking the guy to punch you again on his way out. Secondly, there's the risk of aspiration, where the person inhales some of the vomit into their lungs, which can lead to a nasty case of pneumonia or even suffocation. Medical wisdom has done a complete 180 on this. The American Academy of Pediatrics now strongly advises against using Ipecac. Today, if someone ingests a poison, the first thing you do is call the Poison Control Center. They can tell you if the substance is actually dangerous. And if it is, they'll direct you to a hospital where professionals can administer things like activated charcoal, which binds to the poison in the stomach, or provide other specific antidotes. Ipecac is a relic from an era when we thought a brute force evacuation was the answer to everything. It turns out that projectile vomiting is best reserved as a party trick, not a medical procedure. Number 5. The Alcohol Bath Your child has a raging fever. They're hot to the touch, miserable, and you feel completely helpless. So you reach for a bottle of rubbing alcohol, a trick passed down from your grandmother. You pour some on a cloth and begin dabbing their forehead, their arms, their legs. The logic feels sound. Alcohol evaporates quickly, and evaporation is a cooling process. You're basically turning your kid into a tiny, self-cooling engine. This is a terrible, terrible idea. While it's true that the alcohol will cause a rapid drop in skin temperature, it's too fast and too superficial. The body's internal thermostat, which is already working overtime, gets completely confused. It senses the skin is freezing and reacts by doing everything it can to warm back up, like inducing violent shivering. This muscular activity actually generates more internal heat, driving the core temperature even higher. You've just tricked your body into fighting itself. But that's not even the worst part. Skin is porous, especially the delicate skin of a child. It can absorb the isopropyl alcohol directly into the bloodstream. This can lead to alcohol poisoning, a condition that can result in coma, respiratory failure, and in severe cases, death. You were trying to bring down a fever, and you've accidentally introduced a systemic toxin. The safest way to handle a fever is with approved fever-reducing medication and lukewarm, not cold, baths or compresses. Using rubbing alcohol is like trying to fix a computer that's overheating by spraying it with a fire extinguisher. You might solve one problem, but you're about to create several, much bigger ones. Your body's thermostat is having a nervous breakdown, and you're the one who caused it. Number four, starving a fever. Feed a cold, starve a fever. It's one of the oldest, most repeated bits of medical folklore out there. It has the satisfying ring of ancient wisdom, as if it were handed down on a stone tablet. The idea is that eating during a cold provides your body with energy to fight, while withholding food during a fever somehow starves the infection out of you, denying the pathogens the fuel they need to replicate. This is fundamentally misunderstanding who you're actually starving. A fever isn't the disease. It's a weapon your body is using to fight the disease. By raising your internal temperature, your immune system creates a hostile environment for viruses and bacteria. But this process is incredibly energy intensive. Your metabolic rate skyrockets. Your body is basically a factory running all its furnaces at maximum capacity. It is burning through calories at an alarming rate. What happens when you decide to starve it? You're not cutting off the supply line to the enemy. You're cutting off the supply line to your own army. Your immune cells, your organs, your entire system needs fuel to maintain this high-intensity fight. Depriving your body of calories during a fever is like telling your soldiers to run a marathon and fight a war simultaneously, but on an empty stomach. You're weakening the very system that's trying to save you. While you might not have a huge appetite, you should be focused on consuming nutrient-dense, easily digestible foods, and most importantly, staying hydrated. Starving a fever is just giving the infection a head start. Basically, your immune system is an unpaid intern, and you've just taken away its coffee. Number three, steak for a black eye. It's a classic cinematic trope. The tough-as-nails boxer gets out of the ring, or the bumbling hero walks into a door, and the next scene shows them reclining with a massive raw slab of T-bone steak, pressed against their swollen eye. It's presented as the ultimate, old-school remedy for a shiner. And hey, it's better than butter, right? Well, yes, but that's an incredibly low bar. The logic behind the steak is halfway there. A black eye is caused by broken blood vessels leaking blood into the surrounding tissue. 
Applying cold to the area causes those vessels to constrict, which reduces bleeding and minimizes swelling. So the cold part of the equation is correct. The problem is that a raw steak is a laughably inefficient and shockingly unhygienic way to apply that cold. First, a steak right out of the fridge isn't even that cold, and it warms up to body temperature in minutes, rendering it useless. Second, and much more importantly, that piece of raw meat has been handled by who knows who and is teeming with bacteria. You are voluntarily pressing a five-star Petri dish against a vulnerable, injured part of your face, right next to your eye. You're practically begging for a secondary infection, like E. coli or salmonella. A bag of frozen peas or a simple ice pack wrapped in a towel is infinitely more effective. It's colder, it stays cold longer, and it won't give you a case of pink eye that smells vaguely of barbecue. Fight the swelling, not a bacterial invasion. Number two, mercury the miracle. For centuries, humanity had a go-to cure for, well, pretty much everything. Feeling a bit off? Got a toothache? Is your baby teething? Worried about syphilis? The answer was always the same. Have some mercury. This shimmering silvery liquid metal was seen as a medical panacea. It was prescribed in liquid form as a laxative, turned into ointments for skin conditions, and even packed into teething powders for infants, sold under soothing names like teething syrups. This, to put it mildly, was a catastrophic miscalculation. Mercury is a potent neurotoxin. It systematically destroys your brain and nervous system. The symptoms of mercury poisoning, which include tremors, memory loss, insanity, and eventually death, were often just mistaken for the symptoms of the disease it was supposed to be curing. The famous phrase, mad as a hatter, comes from the 19th century, when hat makers used mercury to treat felt and subsequently suffered severe neurological damage from the fumes. Doctors were literally prescribing a dash of delightful brain damage for everyday ailments. The most infamous use was as a treatment for syphilis, where patients were subjected to mercury rubs and steam baths. The cure was often so brutal that it was hard to tell if someone died from the disease or the treatment. It's a chilling reminder that just because something has a powerful chemical effect, it doesn't mean that effect is a good one. The only thing mercury reliably cured was a patient's unfortunate habit of being alive. Number one, just a little bloodletting. If there is a Mount Rushmore of terrible medical advice, bloodletting is the George Washington. For over 2,000 years, from ancient Greece until the late 19th century, draining a sick person's blood was considered the most sophisticated, effective, and standard medical procedure in the world. Got a fever? Pneumonia? A headache? Depression? Let's just open a vein and let the bad stuff out. It was the medical equivalent of turning your computer off and on again. The theory was based on the idea of the four humors, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. Sickness was believed to be caused by an imbalance of these fluids, and since blood was the easiest one to access, it was the one that got drained. Doctors, or more often, barbers, hence the red and white pole symbolizing blood and bandages, would use a lancet to slice open a vein or apply leeches to do the job for them. They had elaborate charts showing which vein to cut for which ailment, as if the human body were a piece of faulty plumbing. Let's be perfectly clear. When a person is sick, their body is already weakened and under immense stress. Removing a significant portion of their blood, the very fluid that carries oxygen and nutrients to their beleaguered cells, is perhaps the single worst thing you can do. It sends the patient into shock, weakens their immune response, and can easily lead to death. In fact, it's believed that George Washington himself died after his doctors drained nearly four liters of blood from him in less than a day to treat a throat infection. We've come a long way from believing that the cure for sickness was to literally drain the life out of someone, to understanding the intricate dance of cells and microbes. So next time you get a flu shot, just be grateful the doctor is putting something in you, not taking something out with a knife in a bucket. That's all for today. I'll be making similar videos in the future. Subscribe to see them.